Good morning class of 2023. Welcome to today's lecture. The topic for today is pulp and periapical pathology. In the previous lecture we had discussed the pathogenesis of ca uh, de dental caries and we had also discussed about how caries progresses through the enamel and then to the dentin. So once the caries has passed the enamel and the dentin it is going to affect the pulp. So in today's chapter we are going to discuss the various pathology associated with pulp and which is further progressing into the periapical areas of the bone. So the learning outcome for today's topic will include uh, the following. At the end of today's lecture, we will be able to list three causes for pulpitis and explain the histopathological changes seen in various stages of pulp inflammation. We will also be able to explain the sequelae of dental caries and also develop a flowchart illustration. In next week topics, we will be discussing about the various uh, periapical pathologies and the radiographic and histological changes related to these pathologies. So, uh, as we have already discussed, dental caries is a microbial irreversible disease of the tooth which results in demineralization of the organic portion and destruction of the in uh, the demineralization of the inorganic portion and destruction of the organic portion of the tooth so the caries always starts from the surface surface of the tooth that is the enamel either the caries will begin from the narrow pits and fissures or it will start from the smooth surface so once it begins on the enamel surface it tends to progress within the tooth so initially the caries would involve just the enamel as it progresses it would also involve the dentin once it reaches the dentin the progression would be accelerated and then it would affect the pulp so in the first two cases where caries is confined to the enamel or the enamel and dentin the patient is generally asymptomatic that is because the inflammatory components as a result of this caries have not infected the pulp yet. The pulp tissue has various nerve plexuses which will respond as pain when there is an inflammation affecting these nerve fibers. So until the caries reaches the pulp or the caries byproducts reaches the pulp, the pulp is considered to be healthy. So when caries affects the pulp, it results in inflammation, what we cause as called as pulpitis. So here is a brief flowchart showing this progression that is the dental caries will affect the pulp resulting in pulpitis. If pulpitis is not treated and left unresolved it can move to the periapical area and can result in any of the periapical pathology. So before understanding pulpitis or diseases of the pulp we should be able to describe the sequelae of dental caries. Dental caries is not just a, a, a cavity of the tooth. If left untreated, this can have serious implications. It can even lead to life-threatening conditions like osteomyelitis and cellulitis. So the earlier dental caries is treated, the better the prognosis for the patient. Also in terms of cost of treatment, the earlier the treatment is initiated, the less is the cost. So as discussed before, if we have to map the sequelae of dental caries, we should remember that caries always begins with the enamel. Once caries has affected the enamel, then it will progress to the dentin. Following which the caries or the byproducts will affect the pulp. This will result in a inflammatory process in the pulp tissue which is known as pulpitis. The inflammation may be rapid in nature or can be really slow. Based on this, the pulpitis can be subclassified as acute pulpitis or chronic pulpitis overall. Pulpitis has various other forms which we will be discussing in the subsequent slides. If the pulpitis is left untreated, the inflammatory process can progress into the periapical areas through the apical foramen or the accessory canals into the bone outside the root and result in what we call as apical periodontitis. 
Apical periodontitis is nothing but inflammatory changes occurring around the root apex. Likewise, as we discussed for pulp, apical periodontitis can also be acute or chronic in nature. Most of the cases of acute pulpitis manifest as an abscess, which is also known as periapical abscess. If the infection is less virulent, the apical pathology goes into a chronic phase and leads to slow progression of the lesion. This is what we refer to as periapical granuloma. Both the acute and chronic forms of apical periodontitis, if left untreated, can result in further extension into the bone marrow and result in inflammation, what is known as osteomyelitis. Similar to all inflammatory process, osteomyelitis can also be divided into acute osteomyelitis and chronic osteomyelitis. If the osteomyelitis is also left untreated, the infection from the bone marrow can progress to the outer surface of the bone and from the tissue, soft tissues, it can spread to distant areas, what is known as cellulitis or it can cause a localized abscess around the bone. Cellulitis is the spread of infection from one space to another and this can be potentially fatal if, if left untreated. So you must understand that a simple enamel caries can result in an extensive morbidity or mortality to the patient. So the earlier the lesion is diagnosed and treated, the better it is for the patient. Okay, so a chronic form of periapical pathology that we discussed, periapical granuloma, can also sometimes, if left untreated, if the progression is slow, can undergo cystic changes and result in what is known as a periapical cyst. The periapical cyst is also uh, referred to as radicular cyst at times. We will be discussing more about periapical pathology in the next lecture. So this flowchart summarizes the sequelae of dental caries. It is advised that one and all we try to remember this and map it out on a piece of paper. Thorough understanding of this topic is extremely essential when, when diagnosing uh, pulpal and periapical pathologies and it also helps in understanding the pathogenesis. So in our institution we will also use the term symptomatic asymptomatic when referring to this pulpal and periapical pathologies. So let's begin with the topic for today another topic for today that is pulpitis. Pulpitis is nothing but inflammatory changes of the pulp or simple inflammation of the pulp. Most of the times pulpitis will happen as a result of dental caries. So pulpitis is generally or mostly secondary to dental caries which has exposed which has uh, spread from the enamel, dentin and, re re and reached the pulp. Fine. When there, when there is pulpitis it results in pain. Usually the pain is dull, throbbing in nature. This is due to the changes in blood pressure which causes inflammation of the uh, of the pulp and also the pulp is confined within the dentin and it results in pain. However, in terms of hypersensitivity where it is a mild transient uh, stimulation, it can result in sudden pain due to dentin exposure. So, we have already discussed that pulpitis is mostly or always result of dental caries. But is it the only cause? No. Caries, uh, the pulpitis can be caused because of various other causes as well, which can result in inflammation of the pulp. So let's summarize this. So the most important cause is the bacterial infection, that is dental caries, which results in inflammatory changes within the pulp. Inflammation of the pulp can also result from trauma. A tooth fracture will result in exposure of the pulp tissue to the oral cavity. So the saliva and the other tissue will result in inflammatory changes within the pulp. Pulpitis can also occur because of chemical irritants. During cavity preparation, lots of chemicals are used for tooth preparation. 
these chemicals can result in changes transient or irreversible changes within the pulpal tissue and result in pulpitis pulpitis can also occur because of exposure to extreme temperature variation so these thermal factors can also be produced while cavity preparation and lack of irrigation will result will result in thermal changes and cause damage to the pulp and inflammatory changes traumatic exposure can occur iatrogenically and may result in a uh, form of pulpitis which we call as reversible pulpitis if this is left untreated it will progress to form the next stage also another form of transient pulpitis is what we call as aerodontalgia this is also known as barodontalgia and these are because of changes in uh, atmospheric pressure so this is generally seen in uh, conditions like deep sea diving and during travel in the flight or in higher altitudes because of increased atmospheric pressure it results in compression of the blood vessels in the pulp and cause inflammatory changes which are transient and result in pain so what are the stages of pulpitis broadly we can summarize these stages as either fast in nature or slowly progressive so this can be known as acute pulpitis or chronic pulpitis the illustration here summarizes the various stages of pulpitis and the associated changes so in the initial stage when there is no inflammation the pulp is designated as normal pulp early exposure of the pulp generally occurs during cavity preparation can result in transient changes this is what we call as reversible pulpitis or acute reversible pulpitis remaining this this area is localized and the rest of the pulp remains normal so this this stage can be reversed if treated diligently the next stage which results from lack of proper care during the initial stage will result in spread of inflammation throughout the pulp and this is what we call as acute irreversible pulpitis if acute irreversible pulpitis is not treated it causes it results in extensive tissue destruction of the pulp resulting in necrosis of the pulp so this will result in pulpal necrosis and if any of the stages of pulpitis is not treated and if the inflammatory changes extends further beyond the apical foramen this will result in apical inflammatory changes and this is what we call as apical periodontitis so to summarize the various stages of pulpitis there should be the presence of a noxious stimuli to result in this most of the cases this noxious stimuli is dental caries it could be any of the other factors which we have discussed like iatrogenic exposure trauma thermal factors chemical irritants etc so any of this noxious stimuli will result in acute reversible pulpitis if it is mild and for a small duration if it is persistent and it is causing more exposure of the pulp this will result in what we know call as acute irreversible pulpitis in both the stages of pulpitis the pulpal tissue will show edema because of increased val vascularity and there will be infiltration of polymorphonuclear uh, neutrophils the acute stage of pulpitis may slow down and become chronic in nature and extend for a longer duration of time in such a case it is referred to as chronic irreversible pulpitis or it can result in extensive edema formation or collection of uh, debris within the pulpal cavity and we call this as pulpal abscess this results in excessive tissue destruction and resulting in necrotic changes and this will be referred to as pulpal necrosis so these are the various stages of pulpitis and can be differentiated based on clinical features these clinical features will be dis uh, will be discussed uh, by restorative and you can make a note of it and try to correlate with these stages so these clinical findings which uh, which are followed in PIDC i have put in this table these have been taken from the american association of endodontics and this is what we follow in our institution 
so I will just name the various headings which are used for diagnosis if the pulp is not affected it is designated as a normal pulp it can be reversible pulpitis it can be symptomatic irreversible pulpitis reversible pulpitis also known as acute reversible pulpitis symptomatic irreversible pulpitis is generally acute irreversible pulpitis symptomatic asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis is generally the chronic form of reversible irreversible pulpitis it can be pulp pulp necrosis or it can be a tooth which has been previously treated endodontically treated and it is showing active inflammation again or it is a uh, previous initiated therapy so on the right you can see the most common diagnosis that is followed in our institution and this has been adapted from the American Association of Endodontists so these various stages of pulpitis can also be uh, studied from a histologic point of view and these will correlate to the pathologies of these conditions so to begin with the initial form that is the acute reversible pulpitis as I discussed before the, this will be confined to a localized space so generally the inflammation will be present right below the dentin near the dentopulpal junction so there will be mind, mild transient changes there will be some dilatation of blood vessels resulting in engorgement so this is what causes the hyperemia and also there will be few acute inflammatory cells the acute inflammatory cells are predominantly neutrophils so there will be some infiltration of neutrophils in the in this localized area in the next form which is acute irreversible pulpitis which is the persistent of uh, persistence of inflammatory changes for some, uh, longer duration but still these are like for uh, uh, less than a week there will be extensive this has extended throughout the entire pulp tissue there will be extensive accumulation of inflammatory cells which are predominantly neutrophils as you can see here the neutrophils can be identified because of its based on its nucleus which is polylobed in nature and this can be easily identified in the high power of the microscope so there will be extensive neutrophil accumulation within the pulpal tissue there will be edema and spacing within the pulpal tissue as well the chronic phase of pulpitis will show a majority of chronic inflammatory cells which are basically lymphocytes and plasma cells lymphocytes are identified by the dark nucleus kidney shaped nucleus and these are smaller in size the plasma cells will have a, a larger cell and will show a peripheral cartwheel appearance so we will require a high power view to appreciate this in addition there will be vascular dilatation and lots of capillaries you can uh, you can see the engorgement of blood vessels also there will be edema within the pulpal tissue if the chronic if the acute phase of pulpitis irreversible pulpitis progresses and results in extensive tissue destruction it can result in localized areas of pulpal necrosis as you can see here the architecture of the pulpal tissue is lost you cannot appreciate the fibrous nature of the tissue also there are lack or minimal vital cells in the tissue you can also notice that there is no capillary or blood supply in this area so as a result of vascular collapse the pulp undergoes nec necrosis the pathogenesis for this vascular collapse is basically related to the increase in edema within the pulpal tissue as you know that the pulpal tissue is confined within the hard structure that is dentin when there is edema formation it results in increased in hydrostatic pressure within the tissue such that it results in compression of the capillaries and will result in vascular collapse so secondary to this there is no blood supply and the pulpal tissue undergoes degenerative or necrotic changes some of the necrotic areas within the pulp will undergo calcification and this is what we call as dystrophic calcification overall you can see some chronic inflammatory cells which are spread around in the tissue and there will be edema formation as well so these are the key histological features for pulp necrosis sorry if it's a low grade information it is going to give rise to the proliferation of granulation tissue so when there is a large open cavity 
this does not result in build up of the tissue which compromises the pulp blood flow so remember in the previous slide we had discussed when the cavity is small and when the pulp is covered on all sides by dentin tissue the increased pressure will cause compromised blood supply which will result in necrosis in this case there is no edema build up and because of the presence of a large wide open cavity so the inflammatory components will result in good blood flow and facilitates pulpal defense and repair however this is characterized by production of exuberant granulation tissue so there is extensive fibrous production which will result in projection of this from the tooth cavity so histologically if we study this there will be extensive granulation tissue uh, remember to correlate the granulation tissue as you have discussed during healing of wound it is nothing but the same it resembles the same granulation tissue there will be extensive deposits of fibrils within the tissue there will be neovascularization which will be characterized by numerous blood vessels within the tissue and there will be proliferation sometimes the surface of the granulation tissue which is projecting outside the tooth will be grafted by epithelial cells these are the exfoliated epithelial cells from the mucosal tissue which through the saliva has flown over this proliferated granulation tissue and it gives rise to the pseudo appearance of an epithelium so this is what we call as the pulp polyp being epithelized there will be grafting of exfoliated cells on the on the surface of this and it appears to be epith epithelized remember that this is a pseudo formation of pulp polyp so here you can see a uh, actual decalcified section this is the dentin and this is the pulp space you can see the presence of tissue pulp tissue here as well and lots of inflammatory components the the proliferated tissue uh, granulation tissue is projecting outwards shows lots of capillaries shows dense infilt infiltration of inflammatory cells also you can notice on the superficial area there is a layer of epithelium this is because of the drafting of exfoliated epithelial cells from the oral mucosa you can appreciate the same in the hyper view this is your inflamed granulation tissue and this is your grafted oral epithelial cells so with this i will conclude today's topic that is the pulpal pathologies so i request one and all to revise the topic of sequelae of dental caries because all the topics are interconnected to it so once you understand and draw the flow chart for sequelae of dental caries revise the various topics of pulpitis understanding of this will help us to understand the next topic that is the periapical pathologies so we will discuss the uh, those those topics in the next week thank you